The following podcast is taken from a live broadcast on Inspire FM. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the Book Club show on Inspire 105.1 FM. The time is 10 o'clock on Tuesday, the 11th of February. I hope you've had a wonderful morning so far. The sun is out, which is really uh, quite good news compared to the weather that we've had, um, obviously, on the weekend. Uh, we are going to head straight over to a Nasheed by Ashikul Rasul, and I will join you in a few moments. <laughs> and welcome to the book club show on Inspire 105.1 FM. My name is Imrana and it is just past 10 o'clock. Um, and as I said, I hope you have had a wonderful uh, morning so far. I am really, really looking forward today to speaking about a really special book and also excitingly being joined by the author of the book as well. Um, the book is called Wild Boar in the Cane Field. It is by Anika Rana. And I'm going to just start by reading out the blurb at the back to give you a bit of a background on what the book is about so it says in a world of magic realism a fly covered baby girl is found and raised by two mothers in a village rife with rituals and superstition she pursues acceptance at all costs while the villagers seek sanctity at a shrine dedicated to the keeper of the flies which is separated from the village by a threatening cane field um, now, this, I have to say, is a book that not one, I guess, I've read this kind of genre before, this idea of magic realism. And I think it's really, really interesting how um, 
Anika has been able to intertwine, I think, a really beautiful um, story set in uh, kind of like rural Pakistan, but being able to talk about it in a way which is really like fantastical and really, really interesting. Um, so I'm really delighted to um, be joined by um, Anika Rana all the way from California. And dare I say, it's very early in the morning. Um, Assalamu alaikum, Anika. Wa alaikum assalam. Thank you for having me, Imrana. Thank you so much for, I guess, firstly losing a little bit of sleep, but, you know, just for joining us all the way um, from California. I'm really excited to be um, speaking to you today. Um, I thought what might be really interesting is just to start off, uh, if you could t tell a little bit uh, about yourself um, and then how the book came about and what inspired you. Thank you. And so the early hours are, are well worth it, Imran. I'm really uh, glad that I'll share with your uh, your listeners all about the book that mm. I, I wrote based on uh, my own experiences. This book is pretty much fictional, um, mm. uh, but I grew up in Pakistan on a farm in a village. Mm. And I've been living in California now for the last over 30 years. So mm. like many of your listeners, as an immigrant, um, I, even though I've had quite a distance from those memories, they are so part, much a part of my being, mm. um, particularly the memories of the strong women living in the village in Pakistan, I felt I had to write this book. And so mm. I was compelled based on my memories and experiences um, to share stories of people um, who many people don't really read about in English. Um, mm -hmm. I don't even know if there are that many books in the local languages about these uh, women mm. um, who generally do not go to school, mm. or if they do, they go to primary level, and the lives that they live and the complexity of their lives and then the power of these women. Um Yes. I really wanted to mm. share that uh, with readers, and um, I hope I bring to them, um, even um, urban South Asians um, are not familiar with village life. So, mm. you know, I wanted to bring these lives into um, show the, the, the depth, the complexity and the beauty of the lives mm. uh, that I mentioned. Mm. And hopefully people will, um, the, these lives will resonate with them, even if they're not familiar with rural living. Mm. Um, what I have found is um, when I talk about the cooking and the, the tending uh, to the farm animals and mm. so on, uh, not only people from Pakistan, but also from other South Asian countries like Bangladesh and um, mm. India have also, th those images have resonated with them. So the stories cross geographical boundaries and political boundaries. And I wanted to make it a story, even though it's set in a particular location, which is shared by a vast majority of, you know, the, the world's population. Mm. Um, but also also a, a setting which to some extent could be timeless. Uh, it is um, pre-phones, um, uh, yes. as in handheld phones, so uh, you won't see too much of, you know, texting and stuff going on. So um, mm. it could be any time and it could be pretty much anywhere in South Asia. No, and I think I completely echo... Um what you're saying. So as somebody um, obviously from Pakistan, I guess originally, even though I, I, I was born here, reading your book, it definitely did that. It evoked such um, like beautiful memories. So um, both my families, but I guess from my dad's side of the family were definitely, you know, um, like a, how you say, Papa Gaul, <laughs> you know, kind of village, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which I absolutely loved, we, we, you know, when we went back to visit. And there is this something about the simplicity of the life that you actually connect with nature so, so much more. And, and you know, just reading your book, it was uh, bringing those memories back which was you know really really lovely um so i guess in terms of some of the themes that you um tackle in the book um why i mean so if, if i pick one of the quotes out um from the book it says mm -hmm. but most of all it mattered when we were born and to whom um so this is the main protagonist um uh, in the book who who's talking about this and so do you think it's possible to overcome the challenges we face due to sometimes the circumstances we were born into so my character, main character, Tara, mm -hmm. um, she's a young woman. Um, she doesn't know who, from you know the first uh, chapter, you realize she doesn't know who her parents are. Mm -hmm. She was found by Safia and Pagan on a mm -hmm. train. 
And from there, she um, she wants to make the most of life, but mm. she constantly has this feeling of, I wonder why my mother left me. Mm. I wonder who my back, who my uh, family members were. Mm -hmm. um, I do believe um, that the human spirit is such that um, if you if you really have a goal in life, if you really I, mm. uh, have the urge to, to move in a particular way or direction, you mm. can do that. However, unfortunately, for many people living in such areas, there's so much constriction of mm. expectation, um, mm. particularly the setting where there's not enough education, then there's not enough. There might be a lot of human support, which mm -hmm. is always really endearing mm -hmm. and tender. Mm -hmm. um, but other support that could allow people to move out of the situation, it really depends on um, the resources and the finances and the mm -hmm. social capital that you bring to the situation. Mm -hmm. And so despite all her efforts of trying to move in a direction from where she's found herself um, for Tara, who, who is, even though she has so-called been adopted by Safia, mm -hmm. she's still um, like a hired help. Yes. And so, so that creates restrictions for her that as much as she tries, as great as an effort as she makes, she's unable to uh, move out of the situation, mm -hmm. but she does make the most of it. And so that was kind of what I wanted to show for all these women, that despite men and women, not just the women, okay. despite mm -hmm. the restrictions that society creates around them, mm -hmm. they will make, they, they will empower themselves and make the most of their lives mm -hmm. and find tenderness and beauty and, and strength in the situations that they're in. So mm -hmm. I, I wanted to show people with strength despite the restrictions. Yeah, and um, I think, you know, it's safe to say you've encapsulated, I think, that notion really, really well, you know, as you're reading the book and you do get, I think, a sense of that, um, that sometimes, I, and, and it's something, again, which is universal because there might be times where we all find ourselves in situations that we might in some way find restrictive. Uh, so that could be whether it's in, you know, a village of Pakistan or even, you know, somewhere, you know, living in the West. But um, mm -hmm. I think, you know, it's a really lovely way of thinking about it that we just need to make maybe the best of what we have and then and then just you know and and i think that can be yeah like you said very empowering and um and i think it might actually bring us nicely onto uh, my next question and um Obviously, I hope I'm not repeating myself, but uh, so one of the quotes um, again is that um, I didn't care to stay in the village my whole life. I would leave it. I was confident that there was a lot more to seek than the people around me and my thoughts within. Now, again, because that quote's coming from um, Dara, who's obviously the main um, your the main character in the book. So, do you think um, there are more opportunities now, and specifically for girls in Pakistan? Well, I have noticed a dramatic change mm. uh, in opportunities from um, what I saw when I was growing up. And and I feel that there are a variety of reasons that these changes are taking place. Um, one, of course, the, the, um, the ability to communicate with others through phones, mm. um, the internet connection, mm. um, despite people's concern that it brings... Um, brings ideas and concepts in that might be endangering for, for many, it does also bring a lot of access to information. Mm -hmm. um, it gives a sense of security. And I think that for women, wherever they might be, um, it's, it's a common concern for women, the sense of security, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's the time of day that we're talking about or whether it's the location that we're talking about, mm -hmm. um, knowing that you're, um, you, you're able to contact people if you feel that you, you know, are endangered. Mm -hmm. um, I found with cell phones, uh, young women in villages and in towns in Pakistan have more access. Mm -hmm. Granted, it's not to the point where um, 
you know, it's not where it should be, mm -hmm. uh, but there's definitely movement in the right direction. And just recently, I had the opportunity of talking to a young woman who was um, has a master's in um, biology, mm -hmm. and she lives in a, a small town. There's a much greater awareness, and, and her father was also kind of communicating with me how mm -hmm. he really wanted her to be able to find a job in the location in the vicinity of where she was living. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I found more and more that people are more supportive, family members are more supportive of educating mm -hmm. um, both the young you know, men and women in their families. Uh, mm -hmm. It's still not where it should be, mm -hmm. uh, but there's definitely progress uh, as far as education is concerned. Um, similarly, my own sister is a strong proponent of, an, and she's actually a, a Lutonite as well. Mm -hmm. She um, you know, runs her business in yeah. Luton. Mm -hmm. um, she also has uh, works closely with women in the village in Pakistan. Um, and she is one of many such people who has set up industries in an area um, where women are provided training, provided work. So they are changes. It's slow. It's sure. not where it should be, uh, but it's definitely an improvement than what it was 30 years ago. Yeah, definitely. And and do you feel actually that, you know, a personalities like Malala Yousafzai, who obviously ended up becoming... A well, always was, I guess, a strong advocate for, mm -hmm. for education for girls. Do you think um, that's helped, um, you know, having her almost like a role model? Or do you think actually people in Pakistan maybe don't maybe get the impact of her as much as maybe the West have made out, you know, made her out to be? I mean, I don't know if you have any opinion on that. Well, I do notice uh, the unfortunate thing is whenever someone in particular a young person, mm -hmm. in particular a woman, mm -hmm. is aspiring to get somewhere, there are plenty of people who are naysayers who will contradict that aspiration, mm -hmm. uh, who will pull that person down. Mm -hmm. And that's unfortunate. Mm -hmm. I think the same is the case with Malala, that as much as she is a symbol for many, and there are many people in Pakistan and in the diaspora, you know, mm -hmm. immigrant community, mm -hmm. who, who look up to her, the bravery of of uh, putting yourself out there because whenever you put yourself out there, you're always opening yourself to criticism, mm. um, and the bravery even of of you know the what she went through, the trauma that she went through, uh, to be able to be educated herself and then to aspire for others to be educated. Um, the unfortunate thing is when someone puts their voice out there, mm -hmm. there are many people also who to negate it. Yeah. And that's the unfortunate thing in our community mm -hmm. in Pakistan, that there are plenty of people who, who feel that um, she is being supported by the West and does mm -hmm. not necessarily represent the, the ideas of uh, people of Pakistan. Mm -hmm. The reality is... Um, People should take pride in such a young person, mm -hmm. a young woman, defying all odds and mm -hmm. speaking out uh, mm -hmm. for the betterment, not just of women, but of everyone, yes. um, you know, to, to improve education. So mm -hmm. it's unfortunate that there are these mixed feelings that people have about Malala. I really do sure. think she is a hero for everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, you know, I like that you've said and you, you've alluded it before as well, this idea it's not just about women. All the struggles we face actually, are, you know, they, they also um, include men because any sort of uh, oppression, whether it's structural or, you know, it's it's actually going to affect all society and all, you know, everybody in it. Um, and exactly. I think, yeah, and yes. I think, you know, you, you know, you're right to say that sometimes I think those things do get lost because, you know, for example, uh, I mean, it's not related to necessarily what we're talking about, but when we talk about, toxic masculinity you know we mm -hmm. we sometimes frame those things in terms of how it affects women but actually it's also damaging obviously for men themselves in terms of the way uh, they're brought up and then the impact it obviously has on the people around them and I think it's the same when we talk about um, things like pa you know patriarchal culture I guess and I guess in some ways that's you know do you feel that you actually um, tackling those things in a book this idea that you know the challenges of, of, of living in a patriarchal society so yes i um 
as I wrote this book, I was I am you know I continue to be very very aware of as I was as a young woman growing mm. up in Pakistan and even growing up you know spending the my adult life in California. Mm. Um, I'm very aware of the gender disparities, uh, you know, whether it's in the high tech industry or whether it's mm. in rural Pakistan, mm. there, there is always uh, a gender disparity and it might, it, it's much, much greater in a place like Pakistan. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's also the complexity of uh, feudalism and class systems, mm. um, which adds a nuance to the discussion. So, um, a woman from a, a, a you know a higher class who, who has more social capacity in in engaging with education or being exposed to the world or being able to travel or communicate with others will definitely have a lot more benefits than a young man in um, a rural environment who does not have those opportunities mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. so um, I, I think it's too simplistic to say it's all about the patriarchy, even sure. though I feel that this is probably one of the biggest hurdles in our community mm -hmm. is that uh, the gender disparity that we have. Mm -hmm. There are also a variety of other issues um, that create a complexity for for everyone. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah. so I feel that they all have to be addressed mm -hmm. uh, at varying levels. Mm -hmm. uh, but by telling stories like the story that I'm telling of Tara in Wild Boar in the Cane Field, I hope that my readers will see this complexity mm -hmm. of whether it's Tara and her relationship with Safia and Bhaga, Safia being mm. the, the feudal landowner and Bhaga, her maidservant, mm. and Bhaga's three sons as well, and the challenges that Sultan, who is her eldest son, the mm. challenges he goes through in struggling through his education, yeah. or Malik, who, who does not connect with um, his, his teachers, yes. or the younger son, um, who is uh, Taj, who, who is mm. on the spectrum, Yes. And of course, in a place like, you know, rural Pakistan, there's no way that anyone is going to diagnose someone mm. with how to support, best support those people. So all of these complex issues on a human level, I, I hope mm. my, my readers, you know, mm. whoever picks up the book will see that complexity and, mm. and will see themselves in the story, even yeah. though they might not have lived in sure. a village in Pakistan. Yeah. No, and, uh, you know, I definitely um, think that's the case. The the character arcs that you're able to explore, so even the characters who might not be central to the story, you still do get a sense of, you know, who they are and how they're, you know, potentially, I guess, the, the struggles or, or, or challenges that they're also, um, you know, experiencing. And I think, you know, you've been able to do that in a, in a, in a you know, in a fantastic way. And so, you know, um, it's it was really interesting read for myself I enjoyed it very much um so do you feel that in terms of I mean it's a good point what you're talking about you know with gender disparity because we only have to even look in the UK recently we had um a top uh, news um reporter journalist Samira Ahmed who um took uh, well, basically, went to court over the you know gender, uh, gender pay, you know, in terms of uh, discrimination. Mm -hmm. And so even mm -hmm. you know, and I think there is sometimes a uh, tendency to almost racialize things. So I mean, th it could be that oh well, if this book set in Pakistan, these problems are only because of that reason. But actually, no, you know, it's about uh, reflecting on our own situations as well. So even in the West, of course, there's. Um, struggles in terms of women um, still being treated, um, you know, uh, or not being treated, let's say, equally. Um, so I think that's, again, you know, why the story that you're telling through Wild War in the cane field is something that is almost universal and, you know, something I would definitely recommend, um, you know, uh, for, for people to read. Um, and in terms of um, the, your book, and I think I mentioned maybe before that this idea that it's kind of magic, like realism um could you maybe spend a couple of minutes talking about what that means if, if our listeners maybe haven't read a book like that or, or you know what what is what yeah basically what does that mean so um magic realism um represents 
the a story where um, some things are inexplicable. Mm-hmm. Things happen. So in in this story, in Tara's story, flies play an important role, mm. and flies actually end up telling the story mm. of uh, Tara nearer the end of the book. Mm. And the reason I chose um, this technique of um, having fantasy, mm-hmm. magic realism is a way of showing some level of something fantastical mm. in the story. The reason I wanted to show it is that um, when we try to explain what is inexplicable, mm-hmm. what we have no control over, uh, sometimes our minds takes us to places um, where we imagine things mm-hmm. and it makes the story more palatable sometimes. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it takes um, uh, a view that is not the same as someone else who might see the same story. Mm-hmm. They might see it from a different perspective. So what I was the reason I chose magic realism, which indicates that everything is not necessarily as we feel it to be. And so there there are elements in here which are inexplicable, the flies being so ever present and mm-hmm. so being able to tell the story of this young person mm-hmm. um, was because I do feel that as we live all our lives, all our stories, as much as we think they are factual, they also become so, fictional Anika, and magical. Sorry, I'm just gonna hold. We're just gonna go ahead over the break, and we'll continue afterwards. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. This is Atif Nawaz. Listen to Inspire FM shows in your time by heading over to inspirefm.org or listen on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to the book club show on Inspire 105.1 FM. It is 10.30 on Tuesday the 11th of February and we are talking today about the book Wild Boar in the Cane Field by Anika Rana and it's a pleasure to be joined um, by Anika to talk about some of the themes of the book. Um, and just to mention, if you do have any comments or questions about the book today, you can call in on 01582481822 or you can WhatsApp in on 0779481822. Um, so just before the break, um, Anika was speaking about writing this novel um, in terms of magic realism and what that actually means. Um, so, um, assalamu alaikum, Anika. Yeah, wa alaikum salam. Um, so, yes, uh, shall we can you yeah, carry on with the point that you're making just before the break? Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. so the stories that we remember, the stories we tell each other, mm. all have a level of um, magical and a magical element to them Mm -hmm. um and so i wanted to include this um element in the story i told because it's so embedded in the stories that either we've heard as we've grown up Mm -hmm. or um that we create as we go along Mm -hmm. so it it seemed natural to to include it in my story yeah and and also um this idea of folklore and, and superstition do you, do you think that it's again something that maybe readers can relate to um and it, you know and do you think that was a good match then in terms of the type of you know writing that you were actually hoping to you know um you know achieve definitely mm. um we come from a culture where um our extended family is a very much a part of us and so the stories that we hear from our grandparents or mm. our uh, pupia or our khalas mm. or you know everyone in the family mm. there's always a slight difference there's always a nuance to it and mm. they, and sometimes um the perspectives that we hear um things that we don't understand mm. sometimes we will add an element of superstition yes. um and so i do feel that that element is very familiar even for those who have left the homeland you mm. know it comes with us and yeah. and returns when we have our conversations uh mm. about things that that sometimes are not in our control and so we look for reasons why things happen in certain ways and mm. and that's where sometimes superstition becomes a way of of maybe finding comfort in mm-hmm. things that we cannot understand mm-hmm. um but it definitely continues even now with with yeah. many people with from our community yeah definitely and i think this whole idea of of 
you know the unseen world i mean in t- in one sense definitely that you know we we have a lot of stories that come out of that but even i guess from um as people of the muslim faith we know that you know there there, there are veils you know mm-hmm. where some some um some people who maybe have that kind of closeness and you know connection with allah um you know they might experience you know something in, which suddenly becomes more visible but um again mm-hmm. it is you know i think that's what's so interesting whether it's you know um uh, whether you're set in Pakistan or, or wherever you might be, I think yeah, that connection to those stories, you know, is is really paramount. I think, and um, and again, I think you, you know you intertwined it, you know, really um, in a, in, a, in a lovely way in terms of um, the story itself. But so so just to touch upon that, the keeper of the flies. I mean, is that something then you heard about from your own childhood from from relatives, or was this something that you just thought of yourself? So that this is something I just came up with. It's okay. totally fictional, yes. um, but it is based on a lot of research that I did uh, regarding shrines. Mm-hmm. And um, there is a shrine for alligators in Sin. Mm. There's a shrine for dogs in uh, another part of the Punjab. Right. And so there are. There's this complex uh, belief system mm. that crosses religious boundaries, mm-hmm. and um, and whether it is um, a saint or um, a spiritual pious person who was caring for particular, uh, was caring for the people around them. Sure. Um, uh, people come to the graves of those people and pray, hoping that their their prayers mm-hmm. will be heard, even mm-hmm. you know with with and provide more strength. Mm-hmm. And so I created this space, uh, but it was based on the culture that already exists in sure. um, South Asia. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are other such shrines in Pakistan, in mm-hmm. India, in Bangladesh, uh, mm-hmm. which are based on, um, you know, pious, particularly pious men. But there are also mm-hmm. some shrines which are based on uh, pious women as well, where people will come and pray and yes. give offerings and and hope for mm-hmm. healing or yeah. or marriage proposals mm-hmm. or you know all kinds of uh, needs that we have mm. um they they will look for uh, the support in those kind of shrines yeah and um so i guess that's obviously one um theme that you um write about in the book but you also tackle you know some i would say quite taboo subjects so mm-hmm. do you feel that um you know, we need more opportunities um, to talk about, you know, the issues that we have, I guess, particularly in our own communities, but then, uh, you know, just generally as well. I feel you cannot address issues if you don't talk about them. Mm. And um, I I do feel that we need to talk about things that Mm. cause others pain in particular. Mm. Um, I, I don't know which particular taboo issue that mm-hmm. you are referring to here, sure. but what I try to present in the book mm-hmm. is the reality of village life in Pakistan, mm-hmm. uh, which is somewhat different from uh, urban living. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a there's a level of rigidity in the life that you have in cities, mm-hmm. which is not the same. There's a, a level some somewhat fluidity of mm-hmm. of expectation and and restrictions in the mm-hmm. village life. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do think it's extremely important to and and fiction is the best way to bring out the subjects in mm-hmm. particular. Um, you know in in. Dara's case, it's Mm -hmm. her life choices. Mm -hmm. How will she live her life? And how other people are deciding for her that she should be married to someone who is abusive and she chooses to, Mm -hmm. she chooses the only way she knows how Mm -hmm. to get out of that situation, Mm -hmm. um, to avoid being in in an abusive relationship. The unfortunate thing is in the situation that the people that who are arranging her marriage to Mm -hmm. someone who is known to be abusive Mm -hmm. is because for some reason they feel that marriage itself is a panacea, Mm -hmm. it will help her in giving her level of stability. Mm -hmm. They feel that by this marriage that she will have, um, you know, the support of the people around her. Mm -hmm. And somehow this abusive person will be controlled because now she's got people who are caring around and they know Mm -hmm. and they will therefore not allow the abuse Mm -hmm. to happen, Mm -hmm. Uh, which is totally ridiculous Mm -hmm. in the sense that 
you know, if there is a pattern of behavior, mm -hmm. rather than putting someone into mm -hmm. that um, mm -hmm. difficult situation, mm -hmm. um, they should be recommending other ways to, mm -hmm. for her to live her life. But she responds to that situation in the only way she knows how. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. because she has, you know, not a lot of opportunities, yeah. not of other choices, mm -hmm. Um, the way things work out, she mm -hmm. definitely benefits from taking control, she, mm -hmm. whatever, you know, happens yes. to her. And I don't want to give too much away no, of the of story, <laughs> but whatever happens to her, mm -hmm. uh, the outcome definitely is better than, mm -hmm. uh, potentially is better than what she could have been put in the situation. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important to to look at well Mm -hmm. uh, well-intentioned decisions sometimes mm -hmm. and really question is that the best way to do things mm -hmm. and without putting those subjects whether it's arrangements whether it's mm -hmm. thinking marriage is a panacea mm -hmm. and it will solve all problems and expecting that to be the only way out of difficult situations mm -hmm. um, all of that is um, you know questionable yeah. and mm. i think it should be talked about and mm. and usually you know it it is young women who bear the brunt of decisions like that mm. but you know as i say it's men as well it's yes. it's you know both sides that mm. um yeah, absolutely. And yeah, I mean, maybe perhaps, you know, taboo maybe might not be the right word for me to use, but I think it's definitely that it's the idea that you through the book are obviously showing, um, you know, Im imperfections, I guess, in our own communities. And I know sometimes that's not received well, because, you know, we, we suddenly uh, don't take, you know, criticism I guess you know well and that's not just our own communities I guess any community really um, so I think that was maybe my point that you are mm -hmm. you know you are really putting a, a challenge there that you know when there's a lack of choice whatever you know factors have um, contributed to that then mm -hmm. you know it's coming back to your original point of then you need to make the best of what you can and even though you know for, for a reader they might think oh well that's you know that's not really okay or you know I don't think that was right or but I think that's what's so great about it because you are putting the challenge there and and really getting I think um your readers to um think outside the box I guess and and mm -hmm. you know in, in a different from a different perspective different frame of mind which I think is really important um so I think that that was kind of yeah. Yes, it was important for me that Tara should be a real human being mm. as much as possible, not just Tara, but also the people around her yeah. be as real and credible as possible, mm. even though there's this magical realism in yes. here. Mm -hmm. And so um, she she is struggling, but mm. she they are realities. She does have strong feelings and mm. those f strong feelings are not necessarily all good feelings. Mm. She is like any young teenager struggling yeah. to make the most of her life. Mm. And so um, some even question how likable is Tara? Mm -hmm. um, the point is that she she does what it takes to survive in the in the world that she's living in yeah. and so she makes choices she does things she mm. says things mm. uh, her interactions with people mm -hmm. on the one hand um, she does make an effort to be as caring as she can but mm. on the other hand there are times like any normal teenager mm. um, she pushes back yes. um, and I, I don't think it's just a teenage thing it, no. it's any human being yeah. will push back when they are made to do things that they yeah. Uh, that they don't necessarily agree with yeah. um so yeah I, I did try and make all mm. of the characters as real as possible mm. who have um personalities mm. and perspectives and um yeah and sometimes we can't agree with them necessarily but this is how hum human beings behave yes exactly um, i think what was really refreshing for me is i think um, having grown up here wanting mm -hmm. you know when we talk about wanting to see ourselves in in books or in the media and tv and that kind of idea of representation and i think that's probably what was so uh, great for me because you know sometimes you might read a book about a you know pakistani character or south asian character you think oh god this is not real you, you know mm -hmm. they've just used you know certain tropes or stereotypes so I think for mm -hmm. me that's what it was so lovely to be able to read um, and not just Dara's character you know even you know Sultan's or um, you know and a couple of the other characters you think you know 
you you manage to see just that well-rounded and you capture that nuance which i think sometimes mm -hmm. is lacking when we you know living in the uk you know sometimes we we don't get to see you know three-dimensional you know multi-dimensional characters because they're always mm -hmm. so um uh, you know restrictive almost the narratives so i think that mm -hmm. that's what i think was really important and, and probably something why i would you know recommend that you know particularly south asian people would read the book i mean do you think that's something i mean you, is that something you that, get you know yeah thank you for mentioning that mm. i i do feel um i didn't write i didn't write necessarily for a western audience mm. to give the characters or the personalities or the culture sure. or the traditions that were familiar to them and that mm. was one of the reasons i chose not to write the immigrant story, even though yes. I've experienced the immigrant mm. experience. Um, I, I wanted yeah. it to be the story that was true to what I think was important. And so there are some um, sections or there, there's some references I make to the Charpais or the Parandas yeah. or the, you know, all the different things that, that yeah. um, I don't, I try to explain them to anyone who's not familiar, yeah, but... but I really had... Uh, a South Asian audience in mind, yeah, you know, kind of mm. talking to the people who already understand this. And then mm. I'm not saying that I don't want others to read it. I definitely want others to read it, but I want mm. them to see the, yes, the reality and the mm. world. We, when we read books in English, a lot of yeah. times we read of cultures that are not familiar to us. Mm. And we make ourselves familiar to them. And so I wanted to do the same thing with rural South Asia or rural Pakistan. Mm -hmm. I wanted to give, sh demonstrate, show this culture, mm -hmm. but I wanted my reader to make an effort to understand it. Exactly. Um, so yes, yeah, uh, yeah. thank you for appreciating that. I, oh, no, I did want to make sure yeah. that this was for, for people who already kind yeah. of were very Im mm. immersed in the culture, but also I've had many people who are not familiar with the culture mm -hmm. appreciate, you know, mm. the complexity and the, the the perspective that they would not have otherwise known. And, and hence the, the pleasure of book clubs to then talk about. Yes, <laughs> exactly, of <laughs> this course. This kind of thing, yes. Yeah, and I think that's, you know, and thank you for mentioning that. And I think that's why I love doing the book club show because it does give that, I think, opportunity to really delve into, you know, um, I guess the, the, the obviously, the imagination and thinking of the author itself and that's why I love having actually um, authors and writers on because it just gives slightly different perspective on what a reader might you know take from something and I think that's a really uh, beautiful relationship to have and um, I mean would you be interested in um, reading maybe a short excerpt of the book or should we can carry on with maybe some questions I don't know what would you I can uh, read a section that is very um, dear to me, as yes. as we've just dis discussed, and sure. and your listeners will probably think, oh, this, you yeah. know, a lot of harsh <laughs> topics here. But, but no, one of the chapters yeah. that I'd like to read a section from, if that's mm. all right. Yes, of course. Um, it's called The Flower of Mariam, mm -hmm. and our character Tara is expecting her first baby, mm -hmm. and... Um, and I just wanted to show, kind of read the section from that chapter. Yes, sure. Um, and so the, the, this is the setting, Tara and Bhaga. Mm -hmm. uh, Bhaga, who is uh, Tara's mother-in-law. Mm -hmm. uh, she's also the woman who helped take care of her throughout her life. They both traveled quite some distance to the um, midwife's house. Mm -hmm. And the midwife is a young, educated woman who has two children of her own. Mm -hmm. And she's, um, uh, she's, Bhaga is now adamant that um, Tara should see the flower of Mariam, mm -hmm. which is um, a flower which is used to show uh, to mm -hmm. expecting uh, women. Yeah. And so I'll read the section. Uh, Tara is lying on a charpai in the um, uh, midwife's, uh, one of the midwife's room. Yeah. And um, the, the midwife's two children have just had an argument and the, the mother has said, go get some water. Mm -hmm. um, so the midwife stroked her daughter's hair and smiled at her. Go get me the earthen bowl and fill it with water at the pump. The little girl rushed out and her brother followed her. He seemed to have forgotten his original anger and wanted to join in on the fun of the magical flower. 
this interaction between a mother and her children was entirely different from what I had experienced or seen with Bhaga or Jannat, but it pleased me. Mm. I would admonish my children like this, and, when, and then I would hug them and make them laugh, like the two laughing at the hand pump outside. I could see the children at play from where I lay, the little boy pumped energetically and his sister stood close to the stream, barely able to hold the bowl as water splashed everywhere. Her brother, noticing it was too heavy for his sister to carry, took the bowl from her hands and brought it to the doorstep. He stood there knowing not to cross over it into the room where I lay on the charpai and his mother took the bowl from him. She placed the shrivel plant into the bowl and nothing happened. The midwife sensed my impatience. It takes time. Keep looking at the plant. I'm not sure how long it took, but I could hear Bhagan's heavy breathing in the background as each bud of the flower unfurled, spreading the twig into a fully blossomed plant. I might even have dozed off for a while, but I was awoken by the midwife explaining what had happened. You see, the flower will call to your body to open up, to release the new life. The pain will reduce and become a sweet pleasure when you see your baby for the first time. She touched my stomach again and announced, You see, even your baby has relaxed as you watch the flower bloom. So that, that's so a short, small section. <laughs> it's, no, it's lovely. And I remember reading it and thinking, you know, when I was pregnant how much I would have loved to you know, you have seen something like that honestly <laughs> because um yeah and and you read it beautifully as well and again I think it's it's so nice to hear um the author you know in terms of you know um uh, just reading it yourself and you said that actually it's something dear to your heart why is it you know is that something again I, that you I'm, yeah because the story themes are so um sometimes can be fairly harsh mm. I want my reader to feel some tenderness. Mm. I want them to know that despite the harshness of the lives, mm. the women and the men and the others, they're, they're moments of connecting, they're moments of, of uh, calm. Mm. And um, I actually had not used the flower of Marie when <laughs> I had my two children many, many years ago. Sure. <laughs> And like yeah. you, I probably would have benefited from some calming technique. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, but um, this is a technique. This is a, a, a you know, a, a flower that is used often mm. uh, for a variety of reasons. And this being one of the reasons where it has a calming effect mm. on pregnant women, sure. particularly when they're about to give birth. Mm. And so to me, that was a very, you know, it's it's embedded in the culture mm. and it, it's it's a way to connect. Uh, the three women connect in this way mm. and they connect through this experience of childbirth so so that was what I wanted to show and yeah. in fact you know I, I think I, I I wanted to show this unique when we talk about childbirth a lot of time we talk about the pain of childbirth but I yeah. wanted to also mention the ecstasy of childbirth mm. of of you know the pleasure and the honor of being the chosen one mm. to to give birth to another life mm. and and that euphoria that comes with that um uh, you know as a mother child relationship as yeah. well yeah i'm getting emotional just listening <laughs> because <laughs> yes. I know we sometimes we become mothers and we do complain a lot I mean I know I, I know I sometimes yes. do um, I, you know I have, I, have, um, I have two sisters with young babies at the moment as well and you know this whole thing about yeah just you know breastfeeding and the constant tender loving care that you need to give uh, to a baby you need to be full of love as a woman I mean in any situation anyway but particularly as a mother and, and again I think that's something in your book that you obviously do talk about the role of women in terms of the different um, uh, different circumstances, different roles they play, but especially in terms of motherhood. So do you think, you know, was there a particular reason you wanted to make that one of your kind of focal themes almost in the book? Well, you know, as I just mentioned, mm. I feel very lucky that my being a mother has given me so much pleasure. I'm also mm. very aware that it is, it's not because of who I am necessarily. Mm -hmm. it, it, they are women who are not necessarily able to mm -hmm. feel that level of intensity. Mm -hmm. And they are parents, you know, 
fathers as well who can feel the intensity of that relationship. Mm. But from my perspective, I wanted to demonstrate through my writing uh, the pleasure that I have received from the role that mm. I have been placed in. Mm -hmm. uh, granted, I chose to be a mother yeah. as well. There was sure. a choice in there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but but I also feel lucky that I was that I was able to feel it to the fullest. Mm. And um, this is an ode to to motherhood as well mm. in its you know the purest form um, of of just the physical act of mm. of giving birth. Mm. Um, so so it was important for me. Um, Mm -hmm. And I know there are a variety of levels of uh, and in situations of love, but this mm -hmm. mother-child relationship mm -hmm. is a very unique uh, form of love. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah, yeah. It, it is yeah. a representation of that as well. And again, and I think it's also really important because again, you have in your book, you know, a character who isn't able to have you know, children, and then you obviously have the idea of, of abandonment. So actually, even in the theme of motherhood, you have actually touched on aspects of, um, you know, uh, themes even around that. And, and again, that's important, because I know sometimes, uh, again, you know, in, in terms of... Um, uh, the Muslim faith we talk obviously about the role of mothers and you know we refer to a lot of hadith by the Prophet but obviously sometimes we I guess ignore the fact that actually not all women you know um, can be mothers or even maybe want to be mothers you know we are now mm -hmm. you know living in a day and age where actually you know a, a woman might decide that you know maybe it might not be for me which is obviously various reasons exactly. for that yes. and, and I think it's great that you're able to you know talk about those different characters and situations as well and do you think that is again you know quite important to to recognize what I, I also wanted to show that even if someone like Tara doesn't know who her mother is mm. she does find love from people around her uh, Bhagam for example mm -hmm. um, sometimes the decisions that people make might be misplaced but you you don't necessarily have to have a physical kind of you don't have to be born of someone mm -hmm. to to have them as a family member or mm -hmm. you don't have to be in a family in a traditional family to mm -hmm. get the love that you need so i also wanted to show that there's that physicality of childbirth and mm. and the love that you gain but there's also the relationships that you build with others as you mm. move through your life and some of those relationships can be stronger sometimes mm. uh, and a lot of times they are stronger because they're based on the choice of their connection rather than happenstance of being born in the situation yes exactly and, and uh, we so just... that was another important part that i wanted to show no thank you so much sorry to cut you off we, we're just literally 30 seconds left of the show and i know so you have a website www.anikarana.net so is that maybe the best place that people can be uh, getting in touch or um or definitely they, they can definitely connect me through there and i'm i'm mm -hmm. open to talking to people at their book groups at two o'clock in the morning <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much again we're just um ending um the show but it has been lovely to speak to you thank you assalamu alaikum thank you for listening to our podcast we stream our daily broadcast on inspirefm.org you'll find all our daily updates on our social media at inspirefmluton